Okay, welcome everybody. It's so good to see uh, so many of your faces here this evening. Um, and thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. So um, I just I'll talk a little bit about our program this evening. We have a real we have uh, a really special guest in Jeremy Jacobson. Um, and also we have David Irvin here, uh, who is the CEO at JFGH. Um, and uh, what the, the title of tonight's program is Jeremy's Story. And I just wanna share with you what a privilege it has been for me to really get to know Jeremy over these last many, many, many months. I met Jeremy way back in January of 2020. Um, and we were planning to have a disabilities and uh, awareness and inclusion Shabbaton in March of 2020. And of course, like everything in life uh, in March of 2020, our plans change and, um, and uh, the Shabbaton and, and the story that we were hoping to share, Jeremy's story was not able to be shared in March. And then um, Jeremy and I sort of stayed in touch for the duration of the pandemic. Um, and we decided at some point it would be great for us to do this over Zoom. So what you're gonna, what we're gonna do today is is essentially what we were trying to do in March in person. It was gonna be a whole Shabbaton at Beth Shalom. Uh, but I'm really, I feel, I think we both feel, Jeremy and I, I hope, I, I don't wanna speak for you, but I think we both feel, we thought long and hard about if we should do this virtually on Zoom. Um, and we decided that yes, it was a good idea. And really that was Jeremy's decision and my decision. We decided it would be great for us to do it on Zoom. Um, and I, I will ask everybody here that's on Zoom to really, if, if you can, I think it would be nice to turn on your camera to, to be here, to be as present as possible, to, um, to really, to really um, you know, try to tune in. If, if, you, if you can't, for whatever reason, that's also fine. Um, but I think it'd be nice for us to see as many faces as possible and, and, uh, and to really show our attention for, what this, what, for, for this amazing story that we're gonna hear. Um, so before I turn, before I start, uh, before, I, before we put the spotlight on Jeremy for a little bit, um, I just wanna, I just wanna share briefly that uh, just a thought I had, really coming out of uh, a high holiday season at Beth Shalom, um, where I know many of you were here when you saw our huge tents and you saw the whole setup that we had, and I want to share with all of you that it really it took me and Rabbi Antin and, and probably dozens and dozens and dozens of volunteers who put in so many hours. We spent a lot of time thinking about how to make our space on the high holidays as inclusive as possible from a standpoint of the pandemic. That's an important piece. We tried to think about how to make our space as inclusive as possible from the standpoint of the pandemic. We tried, we wanted everybody, no matter how they felt about the, about the pandemic, if they felt safe enough coming to shul that they would that there would be no concerns there there would be everything would would logistically work out there would be signs everywhere everything everything would really anybody would who had any concern about the pandemic would feel included um, and i think it's that spirit of inclusion which is sometimes if not more often than you know than, than should be is is sometimes lacking in our non-pandemic times and thinking about do we really make every possible effort we can to be as inclusive as possible to people um, when, when it comes to our spaces and, and the places that we, that we construct in our community. And I was just reflecting on that. And I think it's something we should all reflect on as we hear Jeremy talk about his own experiences. Um, you know, what, what are the ways in which we are inclusive as a community? And, I'm, and I certainly don't mean to knock us. I think there are many ways in which we are inclusive. And what are some play, ways in which maybe we, we can be more inclusive? And that, that's just something I want us all to have in the back of our minds, or maybe even in the front of our minds as we, as we listen to, to Jeremy. So um, the way this is going to work is for the first 20, 25 minutes or so, uh, Jeremy is going to share his story in the form of a sort of Q&A, like a dialogue with me. So um, we, we've practiced this uh, more than a few times. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna ask, um, I'm gonna ask Jeremy some questions and he's going to respond to them. Um, and and that, that's gonna be the first part. And then um, that'll last for about 20 or 25 minutes. And then David Irvin will, will uh, I've asked him, the CEO of JFGH, David Irvin to share just a few, a few remarks, a few reflections on, on uh, on just general themes of disabilities awareness and inclusion, and, and he'll speak for a few minutes, and then um, we'll have a Q and A session at the end, in which you could ask really the idea is to ask Jeremy questions, 
Uh, David, we did not talk about if people were going to ask you questions. I'm sure uh, if, if somebody has a question for David, I imagine he's giving me the thumbs up. So if you have a question for David Irvin, you could also ask him a question uh, or Jeremy a question when we get to the Q&A session at the end. Um, and Jeremy's told me he really does feel comfortable answering any question, really almost about anything except for politics. Don't ask him about politics. Uh, but other than that, you could ask Jeremy um, any, any question you want when we get to the Q&A session. And really, I encourage all of you to, to ask questions, to think, as, we, as, to, to think as, as you're hearing Jeremy talk about what you might want to ask him. And then when we get to the end, um, you know, uh, try, try to think of a question to ask him. Um, Okay, Jeremy, did I, did I miss anything or did it all sound good before we start? No, it sounds good. Okay, wonderful. So um, I'm good. we're gonna start off and Jer we're gonna, I'm gonna ask Jeremy a few questions and, and uh, hopefully we'll get into a rhythm here. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I do wanna thank everybody here for coming and for being part of this, for this event. I've left everybody one last thing, one last uh, housekeeping detail. Everybody's on mute right now and you actually can't unmute, unmute yourself, but when we Get to the Q and A session uh, at the end. I will. You'll have the opportunity to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question, um, or if you prefer to type your question in the chat window, uh, we can do that. You can do that as well. Okay. So, Jeremy, um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm actually going to spotlight. I'm going to spotlight you so that um, everybody can see you. Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for for being here. Um, I, I, let's just start off with a few short questions, like uh, get, get to know you kinds of questions. Um, and then we'll get into some of the longer questions after. So Jeremy, can you share with us a little bit about um, where you were born? Um, thank you, Rabbi. And let me start off by saying thank you for so much for giving me this honor and privilege and the opportunity to really come before and share my story with everyone. So thank you. Um, I was born in like the Maryland DC area and I grew up in this area. I wanna say I grew up the majority of my life I spent in um, Chevy Chase. Got it. And where do you live now, Jeremy? I live in the North Bethesda Rockville area. Um, I live over at Rabbit's House behind the Jewish Community Center. And Wonderful. Can you share with us um, who are the members of your family? How many um, siblings do you have? And, and uh, maybe even share their names with us if you, if you, if you can. Sure. I have one brother and one sister, and my brother's name is Avi, and my sister's name is Shira, and um, my parents are Howard and Trudy, um, and both my brother and my sister are married, and um, my brother-in-law's name is Ross, and my sister-in-law's name is Rachel. And um, I have some adorable nieces and nephews, two of them which are within this area, in Aliza and Lev. And the ones that are in Israel, I um, miss as well extensively, which are very adorable too. In, and their names are Sam, Adira, Boaz, and Hadar. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. This is a question I'm really excited to ask and I know you wore your pin, which maybe you'll show us in a second. What do yeah. you do, what do you do, um, what do you do during the week? What is your job? What, what do you do? I am proud to say that I'm a healthcare worker who's been on the front lines since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it, there's a level of um, that I can be proud, but also frustrated um, 
in the sense that it's caused a level of anxiety, stress, tension, friction, strain, and all of the above that has weighed me down throughout this pandemic because of some of these concerns that I think we have all faced um, up to this point, especially um, healthcare workers, um, where they're, in my case, particularly, I'm not even sure like what I'm dragging, what kinds of germs or anything I'm dragging out of the hospital. And for a few months there, I was living with my parents and I was concerned about what I was dragging out of the hospital and into my parents' home. Mm -hmm. So it, it can definitely weigh on someone and it's very nerve wracking. Yeah. Your, your pin there, I don't know if everybody can see, but your pin says that you are a, a uh, you're a, a COVID-19 COVID hero. COVID-19 hero. And that's, Jeremy, I have to tell you personally, since we've gotten to know each other, I've every time we've ever had any Davening or Misha Barak for people on the front lines, um, I've, I've definitely had you in mind because you really are the epitome of a COVID-19 hero going every day, day in and day out for many hours in the hospital, helping to, to make things work. So. I, I know I speak for everybody saying thank you for, for doing that and for, for really, it's really holy work that you're doing. Um, I appreciate that Rabbi. Before you ask me the next part, I wanted to actually add this one note and that is as much as I appreciate these accolades and these um, tefillahs, I, I believe that I, I'm only one person who's being able to do their part and then some. I work with a larger group and I feel that they need recognition as well. Yes. I mean, the other men and women that I work with um, in my department in materials management are busting their rear end at times almost as hard to ensure that these floors have what they need and they don't necessarily get the same kind of recognition as what I'm getting here. So mm -hmm. I think that they need a level of recognition and a level of thank you going their ways yeah. well. Thank you. Thank you for making us aware of that, Jeremy. So I want to transition into telling a little bit more of uh, the story of, of your past and, and what led you to this point today. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we could start with, with your childhood and if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like for you growing up, a little bit about what, what your childhood was like in some of those early years of growing up. <sighs> growing up from a very young child, as a very young child, it was, I would say the best use of the word comes in, the word that comes to mind is challenging and difficult at the same time. Um, challenging in the sense that um, I had a severe, I had severe disability called epilepsy. And what that entails is I had many different types of seizures. And um, they affected me in so many different ways. But more than that, where I would say the difficulty comes into play is more than just the challenge that it put on me, it put equally as much of a daunting task and challenge on the rest of my family because it's figuring out the best way of being there for me and finding a way to be there to best address my needs as well as whatever my siblings might've needed as well growing up and I can only look back on it and just be like wow it wasn't just a burden on my parents but it it took a huge toll on my sister and my brother. Jeremy can you um can you share with us a little bit more specifically about some of the um some of the specific challenges you faced with uh, with the epilepsy that you're describing, what are some of the things that would happen to you? Sure. Um, one of the ways that I would like to be able to describe how it affected me 
I would like to use the analogy of a boxer in a ring facing an opposing facing an opponent. They're both trying to dodge punches, but when one knocks the other opponent hard, they're feeling an extremely hard impact. But for someone who has a seizure or some sort of an epileptic episode, instead of someone punching them or doing harm to them, you could be dealing with a epileptic episode where your leg can start vibrating or shaking and you wouldn't, you know that something's going on. You can feel it. You don't know what exactly is happening, but you know that something is going on and no one's doing anything to you. This is coming from, it's like when you get, it's different. When you feel like a sharp pain shooting down and you feel um, some soreness in your ankle or something like that, it could be a shooting pain coming from like your brain or some part of you and you can understand where it's coming from. But if it's something that you can't necessarily explain unless you have studied this field it's very challenging. I mean, for someone who lived with epilepsy, who lived with these different seizing episodes, when you woke up from these, after having the episode, you'd be in these dazed states, almost as though you're like, what just happened? Did I get hit? Did I get shaken? You don't know. All you know is that you went through a traumatic um, event. Thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for sharing, Jeremy. Um, one of the things, well, one of the things that I heard you say is you used in the past tense, you said lived, that you lived through epilepsy. Um, and I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit, does that mean that you no longer live through it today? Is there, did, is, was there what, somehow, was there what, I'm, what I'm referring to in that sense, Rabbi, is that I, Baruch Hashem, have been seizure free for over 20, 30, for over 20 years. Um, and I thankfully, in a lot of ways, was able to have a very, unique procedure that helped to ensure that I am seizure free today. And that procedure is called a corpus callosotomy. And at the time, it was a very, 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 very new procedure. I would say maybe even still in the experimental stages. They didn't really know how successful this procedure was really going to be. We sought out many different opinions. We went with this procedure, but I mean, it was, and I'm, and I'm living proof that it wound up being a success. However, at the time, it was very, very new. Got it. Wow. Um, Jeremy, one of the things that when we spoke about uh, um, in preparing for, for this evening, we've spoken a lot about your Jewish journey, about where you've been over the years. And I want, us, I want you to be able to share a little bit about your Jewish journey with everybody. Um, and I'm wondering if we could start at your bar mitzvah, because I know you and I, you, you spoke a lot about your bar mitzvah with me and it was, and I know some people on this call were even at your bar mitzvah. Um, and I, I, I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit about what your bar mitzvah was like, because uh, in the midst of, uh, um, of, you know, of, of, your, of your childhood where things were so difficult for you, how were you able to have a, a bar mitzvah and what did you do for it? 
Thank you for asking that question, Rabbi. Um, so to prepare for my bar mitzvah, during my first summer at Ramah Palmer, um, I worked with a tutor um, to get down the trope and everything. Um, and when the time got closer, when I returned from Ramah, I worked at it a little bit more and I then prepared um, a Devar Torah similar to what you and I are doing. But the very first one was me preparing this, for, working on this type of format with Rabbi Fishman. And I will never forget it because looking back on it, I think that it was the best possible um, decision um, that we could have made because with the kinds of challenges that I have as a result of growing up with epilepsy, it also caused a level of processing challenges that I um, wound up having as a part of my um, learning challenges, as it were. Um, and so I may take in loads of information, but being able to get it out um, at times is even harder. So looking at, looking back on it, I can say that it was the best possible thing and it wound up being um, Baruch Hashem, a beautiful success because I'm able to sit here and have a similar format and, and be able to tell about my upbringing and tell about my story. You mentioned Ramah Palmer, Jeremy. Yeah. I know that was another stop in your Jewish journey. Uh, yeah. Can you share a little bit about what your time was like when you were at Ramah Palmer? I think one of the things that helped in my initial summer there was also the fact that my brother also attended um, Ramah Palmer for a period of time. And my sister also um, went to Ramah Palmer. So, I mean, I think that it's also, impa it's impacted not just myself, but my entire family. Um, it helped to enrich my chenuch knowledge um, and my awareness of a lot more things. Um, because I think that it was, it was a place that helped to prepare me for a greater journey, which I wound up taking um, on later in my life, such as, for example, when I went up to, during my college years, when I went to New Haven, Connecticut to attend a school called Chapel Haven, which is a school for individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities that teaches them how to be more independent. So where with a typical school, four-year school, you could get these papers saying you've graduated but does it actually teach you life skills? So like say, for example, balancing a checkbook or for a man, if they're not necessarily so great at shaving, they work with you on these skills. And so I can say that there were things that I can appreciate about Chapel Haven, like about any school, but there were also annoying things that I got annoyed with. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as far as me being in touch, I met a number of different people, even um, my caseworker that I wound up having as a part of the Chapel Haven community that worked very curiously with me that I'm still in touch with to this day, that really worked with me extremely well, got on me when I needed to be gotten on. Um, and I can honestly say I'm grateful for that. Baruch Hashem. 
So, Jeremy, um, we were we were in the middle of talking about about uh, your Jewish journey, and I know that Chapel Haven, which you were just talking about, was another one of those experiences. Um, and I think from our discussions, you shared with me a little bit about how you you described yourself as becoming more from during uh, around that time of your life. Um, and I would love if you could share with all of us a little bit about um, why you became more from. And I know one of the reasons you shared with me had to do with the community being so welcoming and open and inviting to you. So yes, uh, if you could share a little bit about that that community that brought you in and how you became more more from as you describe it. Well, there were different parts of the community that helped me along this journey. Um, take, for example, when shortly after moving up there and getting adjusted to um, living at Chapel Haven, I began getting involved with a conservative synagogue up there through helping to put up a sukkah. Um, and then as I got more and more involved after a little bit, things started striking me in a certain way where I began to ask questions that challenged things because it didn't sit right. Certain things did not necessarily sit right with me. And then I met some people that were involved with the Yale Srifka Center, the Yale Hillel. And then I began going from there to attending things over there, whether it be for meals or for learning sessions, such as very picking various evenings to go to Shiorim or learning with a Chavrut uh, um, here and there. And I met various different people. And my journey led me to coming back from downtown New Haven, back towards where the school is, which is in Westville, which is west of downtown New Haven, towards the young Israel of New Haven, where I met some beautiful, beautiful families, which welcomed me. They asked for my, they asked my name and where I'm from and they got to know me. They took me in and they taught me more. They helped me to become more of a more improved davener um, on one end. On the other hand, they also made, they took an interest in me and helped me um, to feel much more welcomed within the community as a whole. And while I was attending Chapel Haven, I also met this um, very, very um, special, special friend and rabbi by the name of um, Yosef Harakov, Rabbi Harakov. And to this day, um, I am still in touch with him and even now he still, um, continues to take an interest in my life and vice versa. And it's a beautiful thing. And during my journey to become as firm as I am, there were many different people that were involved. My journey started. You know, you're right when it's you're right when saying my journey started in New Haven, in meeting the people that I did up there. I'm in touch with some of them that still are part of my life even to this day. But even when I moved back to this area and started work at Shady Grove Hospital. Um, I met another very special um, rabbi within the area by the name of Rabbi Eliezer Kreiser. 
And he also made me feel welcome along with Rabbi Shlomo Baich. And one of the other Rabbanim that I met during the time that I, after a while of, after I moved back to the area and I would go out and visit with my brother and sister-in-law in Seattle, when they were living out there, I met um, Rabbi Moshe Kafka. And these people are very, very special because they helped me um, get to where I am. They've seen me progress all up until this point. Thank you for sharing, Jeremy. We've used, you've used the term disability a few times. And in fact, it's in the title of tonight's program. It, it was Disabilities Awareness and Inclusion. And I'm wondering, you and I have spoken about this, Jeremy. I'm wondering if you could tell us what you think of the term disability. Is that a term that you, that you feel, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts and feelings about the word disability? I'm conflicted on it. I really am. And I can honestly say that because the, the word disability, um, I particularly don't really like that word or the word handicapped for that matter, because it's referencing a person's physical limitations, Rabbi. It isn't talking about the person's essence. It's not talking about what I can do or, or how I can impact someone else. Um, it's only talking about or only drawing out the person's physical limitations. And this is where not only the Rebbe um, disapproved of the word handicapped or disability in this particular context, um, but it's also where I disapprove of it in that particular sense. I like to look at it as an individual, individuals who are exceptional or who are challenged, not necessarily saying that the word disability itself is a bad word. Um, but it's not bringing out the true essence, like I was saying, of the individual. Um, and that is why I disapprove of it. Um, when I think of individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities, which ranges on such a huge, hugely broad spectrum, they are extremely exceptional and extremely special individuals. And I've had the honor and the privilege of getting to know a number of them. Even advocates who work tirelessly to ensure the rights and services of so many. And I can speak to this personally because my mom is a part of an organization that does exactly that in the ARC. And I'm proud of the work that she does for so many. Jeremy, uh, is, there a, is there a message that you want to leave us with? There's a number of people here who are all part of the Beth Shalom community in Potomac. Is there something you want us all to take away from hearing your story? Yes, there's a couple of different parts to it. One, I want people when they have the opportunity to meet individuals, whether they be high functioning like myself, or maybe necessarily on the lower end of the functioning spectrum, instead of looking at what they can't do, get to know them. Find a way to walk in their shoes and understand how they can impact you as well as the greater Besholem community. Because when you do that, then both parties win. It's not about one or the other. There's this word that we have in Ivrit, 
yachid. When yachid means that we are together. When we as a collective, va'anachnu, when we as a collective are finding a way to raise the other one up, then we then we will reach the top of Mount Sinai together. We're not going to leave anyone behind because there is a saying, no Jew left behind. What does that mean? It means that we are taking that step back and trying to be there for the other in a way that we didn't necessarily think possible before. It's like, it's like what you were saying towards the beginning prior to starting the interview with me to everyone. During this pandemic, the pandemic brought down some lessons for us to all take into consideration. Look at what we used to take for granted and be much more appreciative of the little things of how people have impacted not only you, but how you can impact them in a greater way. And I wanted thank to you, close Jeremy, by so saying, and I wanted to close by saying thank you to everyone for giving me this opportunity to share my story. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I, I know I'm personally feeling very grateful to you and so appreciative to you of your time. Um, and I'm, I'm moved and I'm inspired by your passion and by your story and, and really by having gotten to know you over these last many months. And I'm so, so, so thankful that you were able to be here tonight. We're gonna to transition now to hearing a few words, um, some brief words, reflections from David Irvin, who is the CEO of JFGH, where Jeremy mentioned he, he lives in one of the homes, um, one, of the, one of the group homes. And then, uh, like I mentioned at the start, if you weren't here at the beginning, we'll, we'll uh, be able to transition into some Q&A after David is done speaking. So if, uh, if you wanna start thinking about any questions you might have, to ask, um, this is this is the time to do so. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to David Irvin. And I realize I need to unmute David to make that happen. So let me do that right now. <laughs> Sorry. Success. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, it is an impossible act to follow. Um, after spending a half an hour with Jeremy, um, my, my, my claim to fame, really, it's just a short um, story about, about Jeremy. And I think you'll agree, he's, he's a captivating human being. Um, I don't think I was here in the community for much more than a couple of weeks. And a bunch of folks that uh, Jewish Foundation for Group Homes supports uh, spent a weekend up at Capital Camps. Uh, and Jeremy happened to be one of the folks up there. And I didn't know very many people. Um, and we were davening on Shabbos and all went about our separate ways. And, and I had to find out who this guy was. And so I spent a magnificent Shabbat um, talking Torah and learning from uh, Jeremy um, in, in an exquisite weekend. It was just a, a really superb moment. And it's, that story is such a great uh, platform for just a few very short reflections on um, what inclusion does mean and certainly can mean. Um, I think we, we oftentimes, um, confuse uh, inclusion with this notion of charity, that we should um, give charity to people who have different abilities, who are, uh, Jeremy, I apologize for, for using the word, uh, people who are living with a disability. Um, because by way of giving charity or supporting or being kind with that person, uh, we, we convince ourselves, I think, sometimes uh, too easily uh, that we've done the right thing. Um, 
Inclusion is much more active than that. In the Torah, um, there, there is a passage that, that frames inclusion um, for me so beautifully, and, and that is, um, you shall not place a stumbling block before the blind. Um, and that, that's wildly different um, than charity or sympathy or, um, or pity, um, all of which people with disabilities and those of us who have made a life out of working alongside them, um, we see many of these, these, um, these characteristics among people in the community. And yet, um, I think inclusion requires far more action from all of us. Jeremy mentioned uh, that the quote was, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful families in New Haven who took me in. Um, they welcomed me. That is far beyond just making sure that, for example, uh, there's a ramp uh, so that if someone who is using a wheelchair um, needs to access the shoal, they can get into the shoal or uh, a ramp to the bima, um, depending on how it's, it's set up. And so this notion of um, getting rid of impediments to full participation by all people in the community, including people who happen to have, to use Jeremy's preferred term, these exceptional abilities, um, some challenges to be sure, but by way of inviting them in and then taking action to make sure that they are participating equally within the community, whatever, whatever that community happens to be, um, is in my view, our responsibility, in fact, um, to assuring that all of us have a place uh, in our communities. And so um, do not place the stumbling block in front of the blind is, of course, very, very metaphorical. And yet there are opportunities for us, both with respect to the space. Rabbi, you mentioned spending a lot of time setting up the tent and making sure that there was space for people to navigate the physical space. The additional step a fundamental step is assuring that we are attitudinally accepting of and welcoming of um, people who would choose to daven with us, to be with us um, during the high hose and every Shabbos. Uh, and so that is the work of JFGH. Jeremy said it way better than I ever could. Um, I'm a bad backup band, but delighted to be on the same stage as Jeremy and very, very happy indeed to be with you all this evening. What a great program. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you for being here. Really so appreciative that you were able to make the time to be with us tonight, David. Um, so now we're, we're going to turn to our Q&A session. We have about 10, 15 minutes left. Um, I encourage anybody, you could ask questions. You could also just, um, if you have something to say that's not a question, you'd rather just make a statement for Jeremy to hear. Um, definitely you could do that as well, but also I'm sure Jeremy would be happy, more than happy to answer any <laughs> questions that, that you might have. So feel free. I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves now. Um, hopefully it doesn't become too chaotic. If you have a question, you could unmute yourself and ask it, or if you want something to say, you could unmute yourself and ask it, or if you prefer, you could write it in the chat window and I will, I will read it for, for everybody to hear. Okay. I've now, you, I've now made it so that you could unmute yourself if you want to, to do so. Hey, it's Bashi. Can I say something? Of course. Hey, Jeremy, it's Bashi. How are you? Baruch Hashem, doing well. Good, Baruch Hashem. So when when they canceled the disability Shabbat back in March because of COVID, we were really disappointed because we've always enjoyed spending that Shabbat with you and your parents. And we were so sorry to miss that. But I have to say that this conversation that you've had today with Rabbi Cooper was very inspiring. It brought back a lot of memories for us and just want to say we're proud of what you do for the hospital and proud of all your Jewish knowledge that you've accumulated and we love you and we miss seeing you and hopefully sometime soon you'll be able to join, join us here in Potomac again for another beautiful Shabbat. And Rabbi Cooper, thank you so much for organizing this. So I'd, love, I'd like to say something, uh, Jeremy, it's for the last number of years when we've had our disability, we're in a Shabbat, you've come in person and almost every time I think you've given a, a, a Dvar Torah from the, from the pulpit, which is just so wonderful to hear your words of Torah. But there was something just so much even more meaningful. You, you were able to sprinkle in beautiful Torah into your words, but in this format it was just so beautiful to get to know you a little better, to 
understand your neshama a little bit more. And it, it's really, really great. And thank you for sharing all those words. And also, it was just so wonderful to see Rabbi Fishman on the call <laughs> as you were talking about Rabbi Fishman um, making that connection. And it's just, it just shows like the idea of like the whole community, all aspects. I see Sarah with Sunflower Bakeries here. And there, there's just so many. And, and, and thank you, David, for being here um, from JFGH. There's so many aspects of the community coming together. And Thank you, Rabbi Cooper, for putting this together. What a beautiful, beautiful program. So really, really grateful. I know that many of the things that were said tonight went straight into my heart. So hopefully be able to really think about them as we go forward. As we're able to open up, we can be, we can be opening up in a more uh, inclusive way. Uh, hello, this is Judith. Um, can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, do you remember me? Yes, I remember you. Well, hi. You know, one thing Jeremy taught me, he, he, uh, many things, but I remember one time you said you, I don't know if you still are able to do it, but you've made phone calls to people who you thought needed a phone call, were lonely or whatnot. This is even before, way before COVID. Uh, yeah. to you know for, before Shabbos or a holiday and that was a real example to me I remember that and um, I'm glad to touch base with you I didn't realize you were at the Revit's house um, yeah so I'd love to visit sometime um, I know um, I don't know if you know Mimi's there Daniel Ratner David and Daniel Ratner's sister is there Yes. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but you know, I'm a nurse and um, right now I'm not in pediatrics, but I was in pediatrics for many, many years, maybe 20 some years. And I'm glad you brought up about your parents and siblings. It's uh, very mature and sensitive of you. Um, Cause I can see, you know, there's different ways um, that families are impacted and um, as a nurse, and I know, you know, a lot of healthcare providers, you know, try to pay attention yeah. to, to the family also. So thank you so much for bringing that up as well. Jeremy, it's can I say a word? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, Jeremy, because whatever you're going to say is going to be far more important than what I'm going to say. Um, this was a remarkable and valuable presentation, even if you hadn't mentioned my name. <laughs> and um, I've, Debbie and I have had the great privilege to know your family for 36 years and therefore to know you just about your whole life and uh, to share wonderful experiences with you. And um, Rabbi Cooper, Yishad Kochacha for giving Jeremy a format to tell a little bit of his story and to teach all of us so much more about finding the spirit of every person and looking beyond any limitations they have. Jeremy Yishad Kochacha. May I ask you a mini question? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to know, Jeremy, if you'd be open to share a little bit more about your Jewish learning and uh, I guess the, the development that you went through um, in learning from the very perhaps simple learning to now the fairly complex and extensive learning that you're doing now and how that can really and, and, and perhaps explain how that could be accessible to, to everybody. Um, of all abilities. I'd be happy to, Rabbi. Um, when it comes to the simple, subtle learning, say, for example, focusing initially on tefillah, for example, and going through the motions and focusing on word for word and then going from there to, say, becoming a little bit more entangled in Chumash and understanding of 
what the lessons are in the weekly Parsha before going into, say, the more diverse concepts, which I've entangled myself with in the extensive Chesisha teachings from the Rebbe on such as like a Mar having to do with Sukkot or Simchas Torah. I think that it's important to focus on the, the little subtleties in order to gain a broader knowledge and each and every step of the way, if, if I'm like confused or frustrated about something or uncertain about something, it's always nice to have a rabbi or a teacher to go to, to ask these questions to in order to best learn how to properly apply these concepts to one's own life. Because if you don't apply these simple subtle concepts, whether it be from tefillah or from even interacting with say people and being humbled by a simple subtle compliment, for example, it can in turn be very frustrating and it can affect someone in a very different way. If someone, for example, greets you in a rude way, it's not gonna rub you the right way. But if they treat you with, a, if they greet you with a simple smile and ask you, hello, how are you doing? It makes a big difference. It's like what you were saying, Judy, um, to me. When it comes to um, the um, where is everyone? We're still here, Jeremy. We could still hear you. Um, when it comes to, like I was saying, if, if it comes to like a simple, subtle greeting, like what we have done to take the time to get to know one another, Rabbi Cooper, it can affect the, and you've even taught me this through some of the learning that we've done, Rabbi Kafka, um, when it comes to interacting with an individual, it can even affect how we are received even at a spiritual level. Every action that we take or do, say or do in this brain always has a equal and opposite reaction on the spiritual brain. Would you agree with me? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Does anybody else have any questions for Jeremy or any comments? I'm, I'm sure Jeremy's happy to answer anything. Jeremy, you mentioned many things that reflect um, tremendous self-awareness and self-reflection. Um, one of the things that stood out to me is talking about the impact of when you um, were growing up and still were having seizures, the impact on your siblings. And I'm wondering if that was something you recognized at the time or did someone point it out to you? Or is that something that you've reflected on as an adult thinking back on your childhood? Um, it's both seeing it firsthand at some levels, but it's more reflecting on it to a greater extent even now as a young adult. Um, 
because I mean, when you are younger, there's only so much of it that you can actually fully grasp. But when you build up the bond even stronger as a young adult, you have a greater appreciation for these things when you reflect back on it um, when you're in your 30s and 40s and getting even older. You have a greater appreciation for it because you're able to understand the, the difficulties and the challenges that they went through to be there for you despite what they might have been going through at the time. Yeah. Jeremy, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you doesn't even really cut it, um, but but I'm just so, so, so in awe of, of, of how you shared tonight and how you, how, you, um, how you answered the questions just now. And I'm just so thankful. And I know I speak for everybody here I don't know if you saw the number at the bottom, but there were there's there's 50 Zoom accounts here, which and some of them have two people on the screen. So there's probably at least 60 or 70 people that were here tonight to hear your to hear your story. And I think you should be so so proud of yourself. Um, and I know uh, if any if anybody has questions or comments they want to send to Jeremy and you weren't able to say so tonight, feel free to send me an email. I'll write my name in the chat when my email in the chat. I think many of you have my email, but I'll write it here anyway in case anybody wants to. To, uh, be in touch with Jeremy in some way, you should feel free to send me, send me an email. Um, that concludes our program. And thank you, everybody, so much for being here. And, uh, and everybody, have a great night. And of course, I should have said at the start, Chodesh Tov. Today is Rosh Chodesh. It's the second day of Rosh Chodesh. And uh, Chodesh Tov. And hope everybody has a great week. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It was Thanks great. for the invite, Jeremy. Thank you, Thank you Jeremy. Wonderful program. Rabbi, 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 Rabb